Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Dan Baltz, Chief Correspondent here at The Post. We are beginning our coverage of the 50th anniversary of the Watergate break-in with two men who helped assemble the legal case against President Nixon. <clears throat> Richard Benveniste was chief of the Watergate task force in the office of special prosecutor. Secretary William Cohen was a freshman on the House Judiciary Committee uh, newly elected in 1972 from the state of Maine. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you both for being with us. Good to be with you, Dan. Uh, so let's begin at the beginning. June 17th, 1972, the burglars are arrested at the Democratic National Committee headquarters in the Watergate building. Um, Richard, how did you first hear about it and what did you think about it? I first heard about it when I was a U.S. attorney uh, assistant in New York City uh, and uh, thought it was a crazy intrusion. But before we get into the substance, let me just say, if I may be permitted, what a great honor it is to share this conversation with Phil Cohn, who is a great American patriot and defender of the Constitution. Richard, thank you very much. And I would say the same. My admiration for you uh, goes uh, just as strongly in your direction. Thank you. <laughs> thank you both. Uh, Secretary Cohen, uh, you were running for office that summer when the news broke about the, the break-in. Um, how did you hear about it? What did you think about it? And frankly, did it ever come up in the context of your campaign? Uh, it did not. Uh, I had uh, just been um, elected uh, to be the Republican nominee for the Congressional District, and I had uh, planned a 650-mile walk all the way from New Hampshire to Canada. So my focus was on how was I going to uh, conduct that walk, uh, how would I be able to endure it physically, et cetera. And so my focus was just on relating uh, to the people of Maine. I was staying in homes picked at random individually uh, every night. Uh, and so my focus is on connecting to the people of Maine and my district and uh, the issue of what happened. I hadn't heard about it, read about it, but it uh, really wasn't uh, central to anything I was thinking or saying. And frankly, it was dismissed initially as just a, quote, third rate burglary. And that's what it, has seen, it had seemed to me at the time. The investigation initially was under the auspices of the U.S. Attorney's Office with Judge Sirica presiding in the courtroom. Um, uh, later, um, Elliot Richardson, newly appointed Attorney General, appointed Archibald Cox as the special prosecutor. Uh, Richard, why the shift? Um, what was the mandate for Archibald Cox and how did that office get put together? The uh, appointment of a special prosecutor, I think, flowed from the fact that Judge Sirica was very unhappy with the presentation uh, before him in the Watergate break-in case, where the uh, original burglars were being tried. He believed that there were higher-ups involved, and yet there was no questioning about higher-ups. There was no mention of anyone beyond the seven who were indicted. And therefore, uh, there was a lot of political concern about whether uh, things were being cabined uh, that should not have been. And uh, it, the Democratic majority in the Senate made clear uh, to the president that in order to confirm his appointment uh, of Elliot Richardson, as Attorney General, Richardson would have to agree to appoint a special prosecutor to investigate uh, the Watergate matter with a degree of independence that would allow for exploration of all the evidence, no matter how high it went. And uh, 
Let me ask you both this question. There were ultimately multiple investigations. There was the special prosecutor's investigation. There was the Senate Select Committee under Senator Sam Irvin. And then ultimately there was the House Judiciary Committee and the impeachment proceedings. To what extent did these investigations uh, cooperate with one another, get in each other's way? Um, Richard, could I start with you? And then Secretary sure. Cohen, I'd like to ask you that and then follow up with another question to you. Well, first it started with the FBI, uh, which did a remarkable job. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Columbia then uh, continued the investigation and made a lot of progress. The problem was that the, uh, at the very highest levels of the Justice Department, uh, the investigation had been compromised and information was flowing back to the White House about the investigation and instructions were given to the prosecutors that they could not go beyond the uh, original uh, authors of the break-in as far as uh, those who were arrested. And so uh, each of the uh, institutions you've mentioned played an important role. There was no coordination between us as the special prosecutor who took over uh, on the federal investigation side uh, with the Senate committee. In fact, Archibald Cox was uh, upset that John Dean uh, was granted immunity by the Senate, uh, but we managed to prosecute him anyway. Uh, and uh, Dean, to his credit, uh, uh, despite the fact that he could have fought uh, for years uh, because of the various promises that had been made to him by others, agreed to uh, plead guilty to one count felony and cooperate uh, with the prosecution. And so he became our primary witness in the trial. And then once we had the tapes, uh, essentially the matter was sealed because no one could get away from their tape recorded conversations showing their culpability in a criminal conspiracy to obstruct justice. We'll get to the tapes in a minute. Secretary Cohen, um, so the special prosecutor is moving forward uh, at that point. The Irvin Committee is starting to hold public hearings that were riveting the, the country that summer. What's going on in the House and particularly in the House Judiciary Committee at that point? Well, it really didn't uh, start to get energized in the uh, House uh, until Saturday night, the East Saturday Night Massacre. Um, there had been an, an impeachment resolution that had been introduced by uh, Father Robert uh, Drynan. Um, but Tip O'Neill uh, then said, let's not move on that. Uh, and so we really were not doing much of anything other than watching what was taking place uh, on, uh, during the uh, Irving uh, committee hearings. Uh, but once uh, the Saturday Night Massacre took place where Elliot Richardson resigned, uh, Bill Ruckel's house resigned uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Cox was fired. That set in motion, uh, really, the directive came, start looking into uh, what an impeachable offense is. And so we really weren't um, active until that moment. As far as I'm concerned, uh, I was not. Yeah, you you raised the, the next point that I was going to get to, which is the Saturday Night Massacre. Nixon was obviously angry and frustrated at this point. Uh, about the demands for the tapes uh, and decided to get rid of Archibald Cox. He asked uh, Elliot Richardson to do it. Richardson declined and resigned. He asked Bill Ruckelshaus, who was the deputy attorney general, to do it. Uh, he declined. He tried to resign, but was fired uh, before he could actually resign. It was left to Robert Bork, who was then the relatively new solicitor general, uh, to carry out the deed. Um, as, as you mentioned, this, this evening, uh, the October 1973 became infamously, infamously known as the Saturday Night Massacre. Uh, I'd like everybody to listen to how John Chancellor of NBC News reported the events of that day and evening. Good evening. The country tonight is in the midst of what may be the most serious constitutional crisis in its history. The president has fired the special Watergate prosecutor, Archibald Cox, because of the president's action, the attorney general has resigned. Elliot Richardson has quit. 
saying he cannot carry out Mr. Nixon's instructions. Richardson's deputy, William Ruckelshaus, has been fired. Ruckelshaus refused in a moment of constitutional drama to obey a presidential order to fire the special Watergate prosecutor. And half an hour after the special Watergate prosecutor had been fired, agents of the FBI, acting at the direction of the White House, sealed off the offices of the special prosecutor, the offices of the attorney general, and the offices of the deputy attorney general. Six FBI agents present, impeding our operations right now. All of this adds up to a totally unprecedented situation, a grave and profound crisis in which the president has set himself against his own attorney general and the Department of Justice. Nothing like this has ever happened before. Richard, walk us through that moment. I mean, this is an extraordinary moment in the history of the country. Uh, nothing like this has ever been seen before. Uh, we're in the middle of a very, very fraud investigation. Suddenly, the leader of this investigation, the special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, has been fired. What's going on in the office at that point? What's the mood? How do you think you're going to be able to go forward? Well, we didn't know how we would be able to go forward. In fact, uh, while Archibald Cox was fired, we were not uh, because we were Justice Department employees and Nixon didn't have the right to fire us. Uh, but he said that our office was disbanded. The FBI showed up in force, uh, therefore trumping the rule of law with force. We'd never seen anything like this uh, and in this country. Uh, and uh, we never expected to see anything like it again until January 6th. Uh, and, and that was quite extraordinary. So the use of force, instead of allowing a uh, proper appointed special prosecutor to carry out his responsibilities, so the American public, the press, uh, and the Congress, which had uh, been interested to some extent, of course, in the Irvin Committee hearings, were not galvanized by those hearings and still continued to give the benefit of the doubt to the sitting president. Now, with the resignation of uh, two very important law enforcement officers in the country and the firing of an independent special prosecutor, people began to ask quite, quite properly, what was Nixon hiding? And so there was a dramatic shift, in my view, following this Saturday night massacre where people began to suspect there was a whole lot more to the Watergate affair that had been led on. As uh, Bill Cohn said earlier, this uh, White House uh, characterization as a third-rate break-in was in fact a uh, reflexive reaction uh, by the government uh, of uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, to cover up and to hide not only who was behind Watergate, but a variety of other violations of law, serious in nature, that even uh, Attorney General uh, John Mitchell characterized as the White House horrors. These included the break-in of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office, the pr uh, proposed firebombing of the Brookings Institution, uh, the uh, use of thugs to rough up anti-war demonstrators, uh, the use of the IRS uh, against political enemies of the president, uh, unlawful wiretapping of journalists, and the list went on and on and on with an enemies list compiled uh, by the White House to use the power of government against individuals who, whose only offense was to oppose President Nixon politically. Secretary Cohen, you, you, you indicated that this was a dramatic uh, event. Uh, how did it affect attitudes inside the Congress? Uh, to what extent did it in fact move the investigation 
toward an impeachment in a significant way. Well, uh, the House Judiciary Committee was then charged uh, with determining whether or not uh, impeachment um, proceedings should be initiated against uh, the president. If I can just add a personal note here, once Elliot Richardson resigned and a new prosecutor had to be appointed, uh, Leon Jaworski was appointed by Richard Nixon. The Democrats, uh, certainly in, on the committee, and I think uh, representing a broader spectrum in the, in the House itself, were opposed to having Jaworski um, appointed, that Nixon should not have the right to appoint a special prosecutor, should go to a three-court system. Uh, the Washington Post, by the way, was opposed at that time to having Jaworski appointed. And on a personal level, it was the very first op-ed I had ever authored to the Washington Post. And I wrote an op-ed saying that the Democrats were wrong. They should not interfere with the Jaworski being appointed because, as Richard just mentioned, the staff was not uh, dismissed. The staff was still there and Jaworski would be holden, be beholden to that staff. So I wrote an op-ed and the Washington Post, uh, I guess for, for one of the first times, reversed its editorial position and supported uh, the recommendation I had made. And uh, Dave Broder, the great uh, Dave Broder came to me and said, how did you do that? Uh, and all I did was basically say uh, that now Jaworski was a captive of Richard Benveniski and, and the other staff members who were going to pursue that to the end. I haven't discussed that before, but that's how that came about. That's well, fascinating. I don't know if he was my captive, but uh, he was the captive of the evidence. And once we got uh, not only a new uh, special prosecutor, but before he arrived, we got the first tranche of tapes because Nixon did a 180 and then said, all right, I will give you the tapes. And he gave us most of them without 18 and a half minutes, uh, which was deliberately deleted from one of them. But he gave us enough. And I sat down and listened, uh, I think, as the first person outside of a small coterie of folks at the Nixon White House to what was on those tapes, and uh, particularly the so-called cancer on the presidency conversation, where John Dean tried uh, to convince the president to end the cover-up and to allow people to come forward and take their medicine, but stop it before the president himself was engulfed by the cancer of uh, the Watergate cover-up. And yet Nixon on tape in his own voice, irrefutable evidence said, no, you need to continue to pay hush money to the burglars. And by the way, here's how you can get away with lying under oath before the Senate and the grand jury. Richard, uh there's a, a vivid scene in Garrett Graff's new book about Watergate, which is a wonderful comprehensive history of the whole scandal, uh, that you and a few others were gathered in your office listening to the tapes for the first time uh, and struggling, I suspect, to, to, to actually hear them because they're scratchy. I mean, they're not perfect uh, audio, um, but it, it felt as though in reading about that, that you were even more shocked than you thought you might be by what you were hearing and that you and others came out of that with a much firmer conclusion uh, about what Nixon had done and his culpability. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely right, Dan. Um, we didn't know what would be on those tapes, if anything. It could have all been a ploy to get rid of Cox and there would have been nothing there. And so we listened to those tapes and as a federal prosecutor before Watergate, you know, I had heard uh, surreptitious tape recordings and they are of various uh, different qualities. But the March 21 conversation uh, was uh, so explosive. It, uh, it had Nixon saying, look, you need to continue paying hush money to the burglars so they don't. Uh, give up who was behind ordering the break-in in the first place and reveal all the other 
uh, untoward things, illegal things that they had done. And uh, that night, a final payment to Howard Hunt, one of the burglars, in the amount of $120,000, I believe, was made. So Nixon, at that point, as far as we know, there was no evidence of his ordering the Watergate break-in or uh, anything other than uh, uh, what we could surmise uh, from other people's testimony, but nothing uh, approach the fact that here is Richard Nixon, the President of the United States, ordering the continuation uh, of an illegal obstruction of justice. And that obstruction of justice then goes forward. Not only that, uh, and Jaworski, who we called in immediately to listen to the tape, uh, and he sat there in stone silence, uh, shaking his head from time to time, heard Nixon in the most cavalier way explain away how one might try to avoid a charge of perjury while still being untruthful before the grand jury and congressional committees. Never was there any conversation about doing the right thing, other than Dean trying to end the conspiracy in which he played a, an important role himself and had agreed that he would have to go to jail and take the consequences. But Nixon refused and the cover-up continued. So it was absolute evidence of Nixon's active role, not only knowledge of, but active role in continuing uh, the obstruction of justice. Secretary Cohen, uh, how important were the tapes in affecting the attitudes and positions of people on the Judiciary Committee? And if the tapes had never been released, uh, would Nixon have been impeached? I don't think so. Uh, because if the tapes hadn't been released, we would have been left with the edited transcripts. And so you had uh, not only expletives deleted, by the way, which are important, uh, it gives uh, tone and texture to what were really being said, but also irrelevant portions being omitted. So who is to decide what's irrelevant? And at one point, the pre uh, President Nixon tried to get a deal worked out uh, with the special prosecutor uh, that uh, John Stennis, would listen to the tapes. Well, of course, John Stennis was hard of hearing uh, for openers. And so that didn't go down very well. But ultimately, within the committee itself, it was still very di divided. Republicans, for the most part, said this is just the Democrats trying to overturn the election uh, because they lost so heavily. This is not something that hasn't been done before. We've got to hang together. I think, uh, well, we voted. Ultimately, the Rodino letter that was approved uh, voted to send a second letter to the president to get the tapes. And once we heard the tapes, I sat down, as other members did. I had the headphones on, as you pointed out, very hard to, to hear. And I went through the transcripts that we had and measured those against the words that we saw on the page. And it became very clear to uh, enough of us on the Judiciary Committee, uh, enough Republicans, to make it bipartisan, to say that uh, impeachment proceedings should uh, go to the House for a vote and then to the Senate. But without that, I think there was enough doubt in the um, on the Republican side. Um, certainly, there were still Tom Railsback, Henry Smith, Ham Fish Jr., et cetera, Caldwell Butler in particular, uh, members who were really concerned with the edited transcripts. But once the tapes came through, I think that pushed uh, even the most conservative uh, of the Republicans to say that there were impeachable offenses that we believe needed to be brought to the full House uh, and then to the Senate. Before we get to uh, the articles of impeachment themselves, uh, Richard, there's there's one other big event that happens in the spring of 1974, uh, and that's when uh, seven senior members of the Nixon administration are indicted. Um, H.R. Haldeman, John Ehrlichman, John Mitchell, Chuck Colson. Um, 
what was the thinking about doing uh, all of those as a one big indictment as opposed to serial indictments? And what was the shape of the evidence that allowed you to go forward with such an impactful decision? Well, our uh, cover-up indictment uh, that charged a conspiracy to obstruct justice uh, did in fact include the individuals that you mentioned. Uh, and the interesting part of it was that Leon Jaworski was uh, very reluctant uh, to name Richard Nixon. But we uh, on the task force, and this may go back to uh, uh, Bill's earlier point, uh, said to Jaworski that look, uh, the evidence is clear that Nixon has participated in the conspiracy actively. We can't hide that. And indeed, these tapes might not be admissible as evidence in a court of law if the uh, participants in the conversation were not members of the conspiracy themselves. So we need to do the right thing here. The right thing is to name Richard Nixon as an unindicted co-conspirator, even though we'd made the decision that with an active investigation in Congress, the more appropriate method of dealing with presidential criminality would be through the impeachment process. But as far as the criminal indictment of the others were concerned, these tapes were essential evidence. And I agree with Bill that if the tapes had not existed, if Nixon had not installed the taping system, if we had not found out about it through uh, the testimony of one of Nixon's aides, Alex Butterfield, if uh, Nixon had destroyed the tapes, uh, rather than uh, holding out, holding out, and then ultimately capitulating, uh, I believe he would have been able to serve out his term as president. Uh, a wounded president, nevertheless, I don't think there would have been the votes to remove him from office uh, with a uh, two-thirds vote of the Senate. We're nearly out of time, so I want to jump forward. Uh, ultimately, the House Judiciary Committee votes three articles of impeachment. Uh, there's a smoking gun tape released. Nixon resigns. Uh, Secretary Cohen, let's come up to the present day. Um, we've had two presidents impeached since then, Presidents Clinton and Trump twice. In all cases, they were acquitted by the Senate. Uh, we're in a very polarized environment. Is the impeachment process any longer a viable tool to hold a president to account? Well, I think the impeachment process itself is uh, being uh, invoked too frequently. Uh, I quoted a, uh, a Lord Chancellor Summers uh, during the uh, House investigation back in 74. He said, uh, impeachment is like Goliath's sword to be removed from the temple on great occasions only. And I think that uh, when we start talking about Bill Clinton or uh, the attempt to uh, impeach uh, Donald Trump, it's, it's just being used too frequently and not on great occasions. Uh, I think today, uh, for example, the investigation underway against former President Trump is different. Uh, and ultimately, it comes down to the rule we tried to follow during uh, the Nixon impeachment. Uh, the notion is power has to be entrusted to someone but no one can be trusted with power. That is fundamental to our founding fathers, why they devise a system of checks and balances, because they understood human nature, uh, that power is pursued by ambitious people, uh, that power that goes unchecked will be abused, and therefore we have to find a way to check it as much as possible. And so that was the lesson coming out of Watergate. You had President Nixon, who said, I prefer, I want loyalty. Over competence, I want loyalty. You had uh, President, uh, former President Trump saying, I want loyalty. Call me, you're fired. I wanted loyalty to me. And so the notion we have gotten away from is the commitment to the Constitution 
as opposed to the individual. And that I think is the lesson of Watergate. I think it's a lesson that we could derive throughout, but really impeachment has to be used on great occasions. And those occasions come when you absolutely pursue a policy which not only tries to subvert the constitution um, subtly, covertly, but to do it openly through the use of force, as we saw with the assault on January 6th. So I, I think uh, impeachment is a process that needs to be there, but we need to respect it and hold it for the really important occasions, which go to the central part of um, placing loyalty to the Constitution, not to any president. Well, I agree. That's very helpful there's, advice. Also, there's also um, a criminal responsibility. Uh, and particularly after a president has left office, he is vulnerable uh, to prosecution. Nixon, for all of his authoritarian tendencies and his criminality, did not, in my view, pose an existential threat to our democracy. Donald Trump, on the other hand, does and did. And that's a very significant difference. There's a difference in 50 years gone by of our respect for the truth and the rule of law and the education of Americans as to what it means to be a patriotic American. And we have lost a great deal there. Uh, and without getting into a long discussion of that, we were in danger, uh, serious danger, uh, in the events leading up to January 6th. And if, in fact, a few things had gone the other way, we would have been in a horrendous mess. And we need to straighten that out uh, through education and through individuals like Bill Cohn, who put America first, party second. That has to be the rule. Well, we'll see where the January 6th committee ends up and we'll see where the Justice Department ends up in this current moment. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank both of you, Richard Benveniste and Secretary William Cohen, uh, for being here on the first of three uh, episodes that we're going to be doing, looking at the history of the Watergate break-in and the Watergate scandal. Gentlemen, thank you again very much for being with us. Thank you, Dan. And the Washington. Uh, Again, I'm Dan Baltz, uh, and thank you, all of you, for watching and being with us today. Uh, to check out uh, what future programming we have, go to WashingtonPostLive.com. You can look there and register and see what other uh, events are coming up. Uh, once again, thank you, uh, and good day.